Good day. Before I get to the substance of this video, it is important that I do an important thing, which is extend an apology to Eve Smith and to Naked Capitalism for misrepresenting and getting wrong an article that Eve Smith recently wrote in Naked Capitalism. Briefly, and I should say this is extremely frustrating because I discussed the article shortly after it was written and um, really there is no excuse for getting it completely wrong um, just sh soon after my own previous discussion of it. But anyway, briefly, um, in one of my more recent videos, I discussed an article that um, George Beeb and Anatole Levin had um, published in which they discussed the fact that the Russians might have reasons, despite the massive mistrust, for uh, wanting to negotiate with the West, in spite of the fact that they are winning the war. And over the course of that video, I also mentioned that um, Paul Grenier, another commentator, had written a very uh, erudite piece <laughs> pointing out that it was all but inconceivable that the Russians might, uh, would in fact want to um, negotiate with the West, given the long history of bad faith that the Russians had encountered from the West. But also, over the course of that same video, I said that in that article of Eve Smith's on naked, naked capitalism, which I had discussed um, previously, E. Smith also had inter intimated that it might be the preferred decision of the Russians in the end to try to come to some kind of understanding with the West over Ukraine as well. Well, the last is utterly wrong, having reread the article and re familiarized myself with the various things that E. Smith has um, been writing. Um, my clear view, in fact, there is no doubt about this, about it at all. Eve Smith, far from supposing that the Russians are likely to want to negotiate with the West, is firmly of the view that they're most unlikely to do so. That the history of bad faith they've had from the West essentially precludes negotiations. So far from her position being in some way similar to that of Beeb and Levin, it is the diametric opposite and in fact is closer, in fact is essentially the same, not closer to that of Mr. Gernier. I have to say sometimes I do get things wrong. I feel particularly embarrassed about this particular um, case, all the more so, as I said, given that I discussed Eve Smith's article more correctly just a few programmes before. Anyway, just to repeat again, my apologies to Eve Smith and to Naked Capitalism for getting this hopelessly wrong. I don't quite know how it happened. These things, however, do happen from time to time, and I'm very, very sorry. I think I will now move on to the rest of my programme, but just to make it clear, if you list, you've listened recently to my programme about Beeb, the, when I discussed Beeb and Levin's latest piece, well, disregard what I say there about the article by Eve Smith. It is quite wrong. It is completely wrong. Anyway, let's now go back to the events of the war. And um, the first thing to say is that, um, again, this morning when I got up, I saw lots of excited commentary um, in all sorts of places, particularly, um, I should say, amongst some media, uh, media outlets in the West, but also Ukrainian ones, and I have to say also from some Russian ones, about the fact that the Ukrainians have managed to sink a Russian warship 
in Feodosia. And I've expressed some skepticism about Ukrainian claims to have shot, uh, sunk uh, Russian warships before. Um, both the Tarantul class corvette that they claim to have shot, uh, sunk um, some weeks ago in February and the amphibious landing ship. And by the way, to this day, I've seen no confirmation whatsoever of these Ukrainian claims. But in this case, the sinking of this, this latest warship, Russian warship, the Ivan Kortov, well, that is confirmed. Importantly, we're getting confirmation from the Russians themselves. There's even video footage that appears to have been taken from the ship itself as it came under attack. Now, the Ivan Kortov is described as a patrol ship. That, I think, is something of a misnomer. It is a small warship um, with limited range and designed to operate in, you know, in the coast, provide protection for coastal facilities, uh, for facilities on the coast. This is presumably why it was stationed close to the port of Feodosia in Crimea, where the Ukrainians struck it and where it was sunk. Um, patrol ship suggests that it is lightly armed, but it is in fact a modern, though small, warship, and it's another one of those warships which the Russians have successfully made, built, which, if one could say, packs, though it's very small, it packs an enormous punch. Um, surprisingly, and indeed to the astonishment of the Americans, this small warship is capable of launching Calibre cruise, cruise missiles and apparently has done so. So it's a small warship, but it's a modern warship. This particular warship was commissioned apparently as recently as uh, January tw July 2022. So it's a small warship. And there's no doubt at all on this occasion that the Ukrainians have sunk it. As I discussed previously, those two other warships which the Ukrainians claim to have sunk, the uh, Tarantul class corvette and the amphibious landing ship, are old ships. The Tarantul class corvette dates from the 1980s. The amphibious landing ship dates from the 1970s. Um, they're being replaced by much more modern warships and probably add little to the offensive capacity of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. The Ivan Kotov is different. It is a modern warship and one which packs a big punch. So, what to say about this particular incident? Well, I'm going to actually engage in some pushed, well, heretical commentary about this latest event. It has taken place, the sinking of this warship, this small warship, has taken place in the context of a simply enormous wave of attacks that Ukraine has been launching against Crimea. They've been go it's been, they've been going on for several days now. There's been attacks by storm shadow missiles, attacks by drones. Um, these have been taking place day after day, night after night. Seaborne drones have been sent in huge numbers. Drones have been sent in huge numbers. Storm shadow missiles have been also launched against Crimea. And the overall story of this attack is also, it seems to me, one of failure. The Russians are claiming that they managed to shoot down all the missiles and all the drones, uh, or at least if not shoot them down, bring them down by electronic jamming. Um, apparently large numbers of seaborne drones have also been launched. 
the crew of the Ivan Kortov, most of whom, or perhaps all of them, have survived, uh, say that the reason the ship was sunk was because so many of these seaborne drones were launched against it that, in the end, it was overwhelmed. And, well, it seems to me that a huge amount of resources have been expended by Ukraine in this attack, and all they have to show for it is the sinking of an admittedly modern patrol ship. It is still not one of the major assets of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. It is not one of the Makarov-class frigates or one of the Buyan-class corvettes, the major warships of the Black Sea Fleet, nor have they succeeded in sinking or, or, or destroying any of the Black Sea Fleet's um, actually very powerful submarine force. They did damage one submarine that was in dock, and there was lots of reports that this submarine had been destroyed, but the Russians have confirmed that it was not destroyed. It did suffer damage, but that damage has been largely repaired, and this particular submarine is apparently in the process of re-entering service. So a huge amount of... A huge amount of uh, effort to destroy one relatively small ship. And a ship, by the way, which the Russians can replace. Now, these patrol ships, the patrol ships of the Project 22160 class, um, are built in two shipyards in Russia. One is the Zalev sh shipyard, which is in Crimea itself. Um, it is unlikely, I would have thought, that that shipyard is operating at the moment, given that Crimea itself is repeatedly under attack. I would have thought that the Russians would probably have ceased production in that particular shipyard. But the other shipyard that builds these ships is in Zelenodolsk, uh, which is a, a city far inland in Russia, in Tatarstan, on the Volga River. Um, there is a shipyard there, and the ships, when they're built, are launched into the Volga River. And the point to understand is that there's at least two more of these ships still being built at this particular shipyard, um, and they can sail through the Russian um, river and canal system and can reach the Black Sea from Zelenodorsk. And that is, in fact, exactly what has happened in the past. So the Russians can actually replace this warship should they choose to do so. In fact, I understand that one of the two um, patrol ships of this class, which are being built at Zelenodorsk, um, work on it was completed last year, and it is likely that it will soon be on its way through the canal and river system to the Black Sea. I understand that other uh, warships, Buyan class warships, can also be sent to the Black Sea through the canal and river system as well, and that they're designed to be able to do this. So reports that one sometimes reads that the Russians can't replace losses in their Black Sea Fleet are only up to a point true. <laughs> Obviously, they can't replace big cruisers like the Moskva, and they can't replace um, uh, frigates like the Admiral Makarov. 
but they certainly can replace corvettes and patrol ships um, like the Ivan Kotov, which has just been sunk. If that is, of course, what they decide to do. Probably it is. So this is not going to have much bearing on the military strength of the Russian Black Sea Fleet um, in any serious way. By contrast, whilst Ukraine can continue to build these seaborne drones, of which, by the way, it seems to me their effectiveness is limited. They're fairly cheap, but Ukraine has had to use them in huge numbers to be able to achieve any result. And again, it is likely, that it's a certainty, that before long, the Russians will be able to find effective counters to these kind of drones. I should add that it is unlikely that a bigger ship like St. Admiral, Admiral Makarov frigate would be overwhelmed by drones of this kind in the way that the Ivan Kortov has been. It has, of course, vastly more and vastly more powerful armament that it can bring to bear to destroy drones of this kind than the Ivan Kortov could do. But anyway, um, Ukraine can produce these drones cheaply and in large quantities, and apparently it's getting help from Britain to do it. Um, but the storm shadows <laughs> that it is launching against Crimea or trying to launch against Crimea are now, I'm guessing, in increasingly short supply. Britain and France no longer make them. The Russians are routinely intercepting them. And more pertinently, reports say that the Russians are successfully shooting down the aircraft, the Sukhoi 24s that launched them. I say reports say, though I have noticed that the defense, Russian defense ministry hasn't itself confirmed those claims for the moment. It's likely that they will do so at some point, perhaps in their update, their, their weekly update at the end of this week. To reiterate, the Russians can replace losses like that of the Ivan Kotov patrol ship. The Ukrainians cannot replace their Suhoi 24 aircraft losses. The German generals in that recording that has uh, I've talked about so much in recent programs, the one where they discuss Taurus missile deliveries and use of the Taurus missile, uh, missiles, um, mentioned that the number of Sukhoi 24s that Ukraine possesses is in single digits, so they can't afford to lose many of these um, aircraft. And yes, apparently it is possible to convert F-16s to carrying um, storm shadows and Taurus missiles, and perhaps that will be done. But of course, the F-16s are probably vulnerable also to Russian um, air defenses, just as the Sukhoi 24s are. And I suspect anyway that they're not particularly well suited to this role, and there would be a considerable amount of work that would need to be done to convert them to it. And just to repeat once again, the storm shadows and indeed the Taurus missiles, if and when they appear, are in short supply. Neither the Taurus missiles, nor the storm shadows, nor the French version of the storm shadows, the scalps, are apparently currently in production. So, I would say, overall, that this attack has been a failure. Huge amount of effort, huge amount of resources expended on another attack against Crimea with drones, air, aircraft, airborne drones, uh, 
waterborne drones, missiles and aircraft. And, well, in the end, not so much to show for it. Now, why is Ukraine continuing, persisting with these attacks? Well, obviously, there is a public relations aspect to it. As I said, it seems to me that these attacks are disproportionate to the result achieved, the results achieved. But I suspect that there is another explanation as well. It's now, or so it seems to me, becoming increasingly clear that there is one person who is heavily invested in these attacks and who is probably largely and heavily involved in planning them. And that is, of course, Admiral Radikin of the British Royal Navy. Now, bear in mind that in order to deploy huge numbers of seaborne drones against a small ship like the Ivan Kotov, sailing in just off Feodosia, the Ukrainians needed to know that the Ivan Kotov was there. They would only presumably have obtained that information from NATO. I'm just saying. We've had the Germans confirming that the Ukrainians are getting target data from the Americans and the British, and the British are programming the Storm Shadow missiles. It's likely that the British are helping in the same way. In fact, it's a, I would say it's a certainty that the British are helping in the same way uh, with the attacks on the Russian warships. I remain sceptical, a little sceptical, about some of the ships that the Ukrainians claim to have sunk. Of course, the Ivan Kotov undoubtedly has been sunk. I, um, Admiral Radikin is getting quite a lot of good publicity in the British media. I understand that he's going to remain in post. Apparently, the decision is made to keep him in post. One can imagine that there is a huge amount of happiness in Britain because he is conducting this supposedly successful operation in the Black Sea. He undoubtedly will see it as successful. And the result is that the British are heavily invested in this operation. If you read the British media, they're full of Ukraine's supposed success in the Black Sea. And I think they say all of that because they are so heavily invested themselves and almost certainly so heavily involved in it and I suspect that Admiral Radikin himself is heavily involved in it personally as well. So all of that means that despite its ultimate pointlessness and the expenditure of resources and importantly the loss from time to time a valuable and irreplaceable aircraft and cruise missiles that this operation involved involves, it goes on. And I'm going to suggest also that one of the reasons the British in particular have been so aggressive in pressing the Germans to supply Ukraine with Taurus missiles and why the Germans were talking with each other, the German generals were talking with each other about passing a lot of the work in the launch of Taurus missiles to the British is precisely because the Ukrainians and the British and the French are running out of Storm Shadow and Scalp missiles. So they're looking to get their hands on the Taurus instead. Anyway, that's what I am going to say about this whole affair. I suspect I'm going to get a huge amount of pushback from all the usual people about it. Um, they'll be saying that I'm downplaying what has happened 
Um, I'm not downplaying it at all. I don't there's any doubt whatsoever, as I said, that this particular warship has indeed been sunk. We've had confirmation from the crew to that effect. It's just that I think in the wider scheme of things, this isn't achieving what many people think it is. Anyway, let's move on to the far more important uh, matters, which are what is actually happening on the battlefronts. And can I say that I understand that the day before yesterday was possibly, according to the Russian Defence Ministry, the bloodiest single day in the entire period of the special military operation, certainly in terms of Ukrainian losses. I understand that the Russians claimed the day before yesterday that Ukrainian losses over the course of one day came to 1,400 men across all of the front lines, all in time combat line. I understand that losses yesterday were at a comparable level and we are starting to see the effect of these losses in all sorts of places. And we've had a lot of information this morning which points to a very bleak situation for the Ukrainians in three locations. And interestingly, these three locations are not in the Avdeevka sector, which, however, I will come back to shortly. Firstly, it looks as if there's been a dramatic collapse of Ukrainian defences in the Marinka area. There's apparently confirmed reports. I understand there's even some pictures, though I haven't seen them that the Russians have um, managed to capture the greater part of the village of Georgievka, west of Marinka. Apparently, Ukrainian defences there have collapsed. The Russians are now in control of the greater part of this village, and they've advanced very rapidly in the last 24 hours through this village, having also ca captured large areas of um, fields, open fields around it, and apparently those fields are littered again with uh, destroyed Ukrainian vehicles and artillery pieces. Though I would say this again, I haven't actually seen the film of this. So very bad news for the Ukrainians in that particular part of the Marinka theatre. But also... <laughs> Very bad news for the Ukrainians to the south of Marinka, um, in Novomikhailovka. The Russians have been advancing through Novomikhailovka, as I discussed in recent videos. They planted flags on the eastern outskirts, on the eastern part of Novomikhailovka some days ago. Then they planted more flags in the central part of Novomikhailovka. Um, then they seem to have advanced beyond the central parts of Novomikhailovka. There's reports now that they've captured a section um, of uh, Novomikhailovka to the south, the, sorry, the southwestern part of Novomikhailovka, and that there, the Ukrainians are now reduced to areas in the northwest of Novomikhailovka. It looks like Ukrainian defenses in Novomikhailovka are starting to break down. And the Russians also seem to be making significant further advances north of Marinka um, in Krasnogorovka. It looks as if they've enlarged the area of Krasnogorovka that they control. Krasnogorovka, the last important uh, village or small town, perhaps, more properly, that the Ukrainians control, close to Donetsk City, the place from which, as it happens, I understand that the heaviest shelling of Donetsk City has taken place. It looks as if the Ukrainians are now in the process of losing 
Krasnogorovka. And there's now also more reports that the Russians are at the edge of Nevolsky, a village to the northeast of Krasnogorovka, and that they have apparently entered that village, at least that's what my understanding is, and that village looks likely to be captured fairly soon. And the Russians are apparently bombing and attacking Ukrainian positions um, in all in the various fields around these places, Krasnogorovka and Nevolska. And um, apparently there's lots of pictures and films now of Ukrainian artillery pieces and armored vehicles being destroyed in these in these fields where they are easy targets for the Russian Air Force and um, the various uh, kamikaze drones that the Russians have been deploying in very heavy numbers in this part of the battlefield. And in fact, even further north, there's a lot of fighting been going on for several weeks now for control of a large village or small town called Pervomaisky, which is located to the southwest of Avdevka and to the northwest of Krasnogorovka. It looks like the Russians finally are close to gaining full control of that village and town as well. So we're starting to see evidence of the gradual collapse of Ukrainian positions in what might be called the Marinka area. Um, Novomikhailovka, Georgievka, apparently about to fall, uh, Novoskoy, perhaps about to fall also, quite probably Pervomaisky too. I get the sense that the fighting in Krasnogorovka still has some weeks to go, as so this is a big place. But there's an interesting fact about all of these villages, which is that usually in Donbass, various villages and towns are located very close to each other. Um, looking at the maps that have been provided by various people of these um, places, Krasnogorovka, Pervomaisky, Nevolskoy, uh, all of the rest. Um, this appears to be a much less densely inhabited part of Donbass. It's a case of uh, um, small towns and settlements surrounded by open steppe land fields. And that must make it much more difficult for the Ukrainians to move troops and supplies from one place to another in the face of overwhelming Russian air and artillery power, given that there is essentially no cover. So this probably explains why the Russians, having successfully captured Marinka several weeks ago and having consolidated control of the villages around Marinka, notably Pabieda, are suddenly able to make all this progress so quickly. We'll see what happens, but clearly this is another area where the Ukrainians appear to be facing a major operational crisis. And as of this moment in time, it doesn't seem that they have any real plan or idea of what to do. And perhaps, realistically, there isn't very much they can do. Anyway, that's a bad situation in the Marinka area. Um, another very bad situation, apparently, starting to develop in the Bakhmut area. Now, over the last couple of weeks, the Russians, having some weeks ago captured the village of Khromovo, to the north-west of Bakhmut, one of the three villages, Khromovo, Bogdanovka and Ivanivska, 
which the Wagner group never managed to capture during their offensive in this area this time last year, the one which eventually led to the capture of Bakhmut itself. Anyway, the Russians, having some weeks ago, managed to, ca managed to capture uh, Kromovo. They went on, and firstly, they've established themselves in significant part of Bogdanov Bogdanovka, though control of this village remains contested. And interestingly, their primary focus has been on capturing Ivanivska. And it seems that they managed to gain control of most of the territory around Ivanivska. And we're now getting reports that Ivanivska is about to fall. There are suggestions that the Russians control between 50 and 70 percent of Ivanivska. Though, of course, I'm not able to confirm that myself. Moreover, it seems that the Russians have established effective air control over the roads and um, fields leading to Ivanivska so that Ukrainian troops that try to um, enter or leave this village are likely to come under he heavy artillery and drone attack and even bomb attacks by the Russian Air Force. There are reports, incidentally, that Russian bombing of Ukrainian positions around Bakhmut has been steadily intensifying with bombing of Chasovya, which is obviously the major staging area of the Ukrainian forces in uh, close to Bakhmut, that bombing of Chasovya is now reaching industrial levels. Anyway, um, Ivaniska could be about to fall, and apparently there's also now a fair number of videos showing Ukrainian soldiers in Ivanivska giving up <clears throat> and surrendering to the Russians. <clears throat> the intensity of the fighting here apparently is now re reaching the levels that we most recently saw in Avdeevka, further south. So intense fighting going on in the Bakhmut area with the Russians managing to um, come close to capturing Ivanivska. It's widely assumed that once they've captured Ivanivska, they will be able to move on and start to attack Chasov Yar itself. I don't know whether they will first <clears throat> decide to sort out the problems that they still have in Bogdan Bogdanovka, bring that village fully under control. Um, most likely, initially, they will be focusing on capturing um, the part of Chasov Yar, east of the <clears throat> Chasov Yar Canal. It's becoming, I think, widely expected that the Russians are unlikely, however, to stop at the canal. Nobody quite knows what they're going to do, whether they're going to continue their offensive by advancing northwards, um, aiming to resolve the remaining um, problems caused for them by the two Ukrainian by the two Ukrainian-held towns to the north, um, Siversk and Belogorodka, or whether instead they will cross the Chasovya Canal and advance and try to capture Chasovya itself and the rather more heavily fortified town of Konstantinovka, which lies to the west of it. And, of course, if they do capture Chasovya and Konstantinovka, then the way opens to Kramatorsk, the big town, the part of the Slavyansk, Kramatorsk, conurbation, the two big towns, Slavyansk and Kramatorsk, which together essentially constitute 
the last major urban concentration in Donbass, <clears throat> still under Ukrainian control, and also effectively, essentially, in this part of Donbass, the last possible defense line the Ukrainians could have east of the Dnieper River. Anyway, bad situation, deteriorating situation for the Ukrainians um, in the Bakhmut area, in the Chasovya area. And further north still, we're now getting more and more reports, and it does look increasingly as if these reports are reliable, that the Russian advance towards the Zherebets River um, has um, continued, and that the Russians are indeed now in the process of launching an assault on Tierny, which is um, a large village or small town on the Zherebets River. And it's widely accepted that if they capture uh, Tierny, <coughs> the other Ukrainian-held villages on the east bank of the Zherebets River will also fall. <coughs> and, of course, if they do, then that creates openings for the Russians, either to advance north to sort out Kupiansk, where there's been a lot less fighting in recent weeks. The Russians seem to be waiting on events elsewhere, perhaps building up their forces, perhaps planning all sorts of things. We don't really know a huge amount about all of that. Or perhaps, and I would have thought more plausibly, the Russian objective will be to cross the Zherebetsi River and move towards Liman. And of course, the point about recapturing Liman, town which the Russians captured, in May 2022, but which they lost in October 2022 at the high tide point of Ukraine's Kharkov counteroffensive. Well, the point of capturing Liman is that Liman would put them again within striking distance of Slavyansk. Uh, Liman is, in effect, a kind of suburb of Slavyansk just as Konstantinovka could be described as a, a suburb of Kramatorsk. And of course, if the Russians capture Chasov Yar and Kramatorsk and Liman to the east of Slavyansk itself, and then if they're able to capture Kupiansk and move on and regain control of Izium and Balaklaya, well, then they're at a strong position at that point to launch a sustained offensive and a major attack on this last big potential Ukrainian defense line in the northwest Donbass with the two key cities of Slavyansk and Kramatorsk. Now, that's what's going on in the north, but of course. There's also lots going on still in Avdevka, only we're getting a lot less news about it than we have done. I discussed yesterday how, in my opinion, Valterson has provided the single most accurate account of the recent fighting in Avdevka, that the Russians uh, last week managed, or came, managed to gain control, effective control of three villages, Toninka, um, Orlovka and Berdichi, um, that the Ukrainians counterattacked, almost certainly on General Sirsky's orders, that the Ukrainians suffered horrendous losses over the course of, this, of these counterattacks, but were able to stop the Russian advances and were able to regain control of part of all three of these villages, that the fighting has continued at a very intense level, and that the Russians have been shelling and bombing in the area very intensively since then. Well, we've not heard further news of more Russian advances in this area. I suspect that the Russians, having encountered these elite units of the Ukrainian military, 
um, are now transferring further forces to reinforce their advance towards um, uh, west of Avdevka, beyond, you know, to try and capture, fully capture these villages and move west beyond them. There's probably a lot of fighting taking place still. There, as I said, we're getting less news about it. But um, one thing that they're probably also doing is that they are capitalizing on the Ukrainian panic about Avdevka and the deployment of large forces to Ukrainian forces to try to stabilize the situation in Avdevka, that the Russians are probably capitalizing on that by increasing their pressure elsewhere, by taking, or at least advancing, as we've seen, in the Marinka area, in Novomikhailovka, in um, Georgievka, in Krasnogorovka, in, Novo, Novo so in, in um, Novoservoye, just north of Krasnogorovka, in Pervomaisky, in Terny, in Ivanivska, Probably, to some extent at least, this is all a reflection of the crisis that is facing the Ukrainians in Avdevka and the fact that they've had to tr pull many of their best troops from other parts of the front lines to try to hold the positions in Avdevka with the sense that it's around Avdevka that the best equipment and the most of the limited supplies of ammunition is being sent by, sent by Ukraine itself. Now, I ought to say I've been sort of reading over the last couple of days um, some of the books by uh, the American historian David Glantz, who's examined the performance of the Red Army during the Second World War. And I've also been looking at other events in relatively modern Russian history, including the Brusilov offensive that was carried out by the Russians um, in the First World War in 1916, which was in some respects the single most successful uh, offensive conducted by any army. Um, over the course of the First World War on the Eastern Front, it appears to have largely smashed Austria-Hungary's army, and it looks as if the Austrians never fully recovered from the defeat that General Brusilov um, inflicted upon them there. And again, to stress, I'm not a, no sort of military expert, but there's again been a great deal of discussion recently about how you know all the surveillance the road the drones the satellites all of this has now completely changed the shape of war and that that means that military philosophies developed by um, previous generations of military thinkers have now become out of date well the one thing i've learned from all of this reading is that in fact, in the first half of the 20th century, having examined the lessons of the First World War, the Russians came to the view that the right way to deal with modern warfare was, on, was to attack on a broad front, stretching the enemy's defences, creating cracks along those defences, and only when the entire enemy front line starts to break down, only at that point launch the big advance capitalising on the gradual collapse of the enemy's front line, launching the big advance, which basically knocks the enemy off balance and brings about his collapse. 
That apparently is deep battle, the, the famous strategy of deep battle, which we hear so much about, is so often talked about in connection with what the Russians do. Well, I don't know whether the Russians are planning some deep penetration deep within Ukraine. But I have to say that up to this point in time, this advance along the entire front line, the pressure that the Russians are exerting along the entirety of the front line, putting the pressure, increasing the pressure, <laughs> causing the defences to crack, causing the um, enemy <laughs> to transfer reserves from one point to another, establish fire brigade units trying to ho plug holes, with the holes increasing all the time in size. All of that seems to me to be completely consistent with these historic Russian doctrines, which have their origins in the pre-Second World War era, and which certainly informed much of the thinking of the Soviet army in the post-Second World War period. Now, it may be, as I said, that things have moved on and that there will be further developments um, later. I'm not going to say. But again, I, I would say that I think people are in too much of a hurry to say that the shape of modern war has changed completely as a result of these new technological developments and that the kind of deep battle operations that the Russians have worked with in the past have become out of date. I don't think that the facts of this war up to now support those claims. But anyway, that's just my own view. Again, I expect I'm going to get some pushback for it. Now, what are the Ukrainians going to do? They, they have the Russians piling on the pressure right across the front lines. Um, situation is becoming very critical in um, the Marinka area, the Bakhmut area, in the Liman area. It is likely that the Russians are going to launch uh, further attacks uh, in the Avdevka area. They're resuming heavy bombing of the major town of Pakrovsk which is to the west of Avdevka and which is um, in some ways as important in this part of the front lines as Slavyansk and Kramatorsk are further north. It's likely too that with the Russian advances in Novomikhailovka and Georgievka, the position of the Ukrainian troops in Vugladar, right at the southern end, is going to start to become unstable as well. They're also faced with very difficult to understand, but nonetheless very aggressive uh, operations by the Russians in the Zaporozhye area, in uh, the Varabotino Verbovoye area, where the Russians advance and then pull back and then advance again, and also appear to launch bombing strikes. So what exactly is it that the Ukrainians are going to do? Well, there's a very interesting article in the Washington Post which said that Ukraine is running out of soldiers but has no coherent mobilisation plan. Apparently, there's been lots of talk about additional mobilisation in Ukraine, but Ukraine has no clear plan about how to mobilize further men and in order to plug the holes in its army. And, well, it looks as if the whole mobilization, the whole mobilization plan so heavily discussed for so many months. I remember doing programs um, at the end of last year, 2023, the end of 2023, discussing my dismay at the plans to call up half a million men, women, 
to fill up the numbers in the Ukrainian army, I, saying that I thought this would be a disastrous mistake. Well, it looks as if these are being scaled down all the time, not because there isn't the desire on the part of some people in Ukraine to do it, but because the means to do it are starting to look like they're coming, becoming, falling out of reach. And in addition, <laughs> um, it's not at all clear what Ukraine would be able to do with these people if it were able to call them up. And there is enormous public and popular resistance to calling them, calling them up anyway. And anyway, that's what the Washington Post says. So Ukraine needs more soldiers, but it's not going to be able to conscript enough to fill up, to, to plug the holes. Um, and it doesn't have a plan to do it. And to the extent that it's trying to do it, it is only destabilizing the domestic political situation. There is, by the way, a rather mischievous article uh, published today by the Russian news agency TASS, which insinuates that the Western powers are now working on a plan to help Zelensky escape Kiev if things there get too hot for him. I think this is, as I said, pure mischief making myself. I don't take it especially seriously. But the Russians would only be publishing an article like that if they sensed that the political situation in Ukraine was indeed becoming more and more fragile. And of course, they're publishing this kind of article in order to affect nerves into in Ukraine and to make it more fragile still. So there's that going on. There's problems with the there's problems with the lack of manpower. And we've had a most astonishing exchange between the Ukrainians and the EU on the question of shells. A couple of days ago, Zelensky complained that the EU had promised Ukraine 1 million shells, 1 million 155 millimeter shells. He said that only 300,000 of the 1 million promised had been delivered. And now we've had the EU Commission shoot back and say that Zelensky is wrong. It's the first time I think I've seen them actually argue with Zelensky on an issue like this. They're saying that they've delivered all of the shells that they said they would donate to Ukraine. Ukraine is supposed to buy, apparently, the remainder, which, well, we'd never heard or been told that before. At least I'd not understood that to be the case and supposedly there's only a proportion of the shells that would be bought from the EU itself um, some other shells supplies of shells supposedly are to be provided by the EU member states acting by themselves independently of the EU and in total, the EU has supplied since March last year through these various means, donations, um, sales and all of the rest and transfers from specific EU states. They've actually transferred to Ukraine 700,000 shells. <laughs> Interesting argument, but it seems to me that it's opening up a number of further questions. If the EU has indeed supplied to Ukraine 700,000 shells up to this point since March last year, 
And if the United States has also given Ukraine 500,000 shells from South Korea, as I think is universally acknowledged, then that means that since March last year, Ukraine has had 1.2 million shells provided to it. 1.2 million. And yet, every report says that Ukraine is now desperately short of shells. If this is correct, if this information we're getting from the EU is right, then it tells us an important thing, that no amount of shells that the US and the EU together could supply to Ukraine on the basis of their own industrial resources will ever be enough. If the Ukrainians can run through 1.2 million shells in less than a year and find themselves in the disastrous situation that they are, where they are facing shell famine, given even the most optimistic production figures from the United States and the EU, this problem is going to continue. This problem with shells is going to continue. And it is only going to get worse. And I say that because we're now getting more and more admissions, even in the Western media, about Russian industrial prowess in this area. And there was an interesting article in, of all places, Washington Examiner, a um, very hardline Republican um, publication, one very supportive overall of uh, near compositions. But we have, and this is a quote from an anonymous Western military official. We're not told who this person is. But anyway, this person talks about, is quoted by Washington Examiner, talking about Russian production capacities. And he says this, their industrial capacity is, I mean, it's vast. Their level of financial investment in industry, defense industry, is vast. And I think that worries us in terms of overmatch. And, well, everything that we hear about the shell situation, and indeed everything, every other situation, tells us essentially the same story, right down to the fact that the Russians can replace ship losses in the Black Sea, whereas the West can't replace the missiles that it is launching against Russian targets in Crimea and the Black Sea. So, moving on, problems with shells and equipment from the West and comments of the EU Commission that they need, the Ukrainians need to understand that they have to buy some of this equipment. This isn't being given to them for free. It's all a misunderstanding if people thought it was. How is Ukraine going to pay for huge amounts of equipment from the West? The Ukrainian Prime Minister has just come out and said that there is a $37 billion hole in Ukraine's budget this year. Unless Ukraine gets more funding from the West, it's not going to be able to plug its budget hole and it will be forced to do one of two things, either print money and lurch into a hyperinflation crisis, inevitable in the kind of economic and military condition that Ukraine finds itself in, with its economy essentially destroyed, or alternatively, it's going to have to undertake massive cuts in spending, which inevitably at some point will also have bearing both on the political stability of the country and, in, and its war effort. So how is Ukraine going to find the shells if the West isn't going to stomp up 
even more money for Ukraine in order to buy shells and other military equipment. This is increasingly starting to look like one of those situations where a cat chases its tail. Of course, it can never quite catch it. It has to just go on running after its own tail because, well, mathematically, it can never it can never hold it. It's it's a bizarre situation. And again, one does wonder whether people in the West have understood this. The only way that Ukraine can be kept going is not by keeping commitments at a certain level, but by increasing them. More and more, at greater and greater costs, cost, and it would seem achieving less and less of a result. Anyway, there we go. So, a very difficult and very bad situation on the battlefront for Ukraine. But note again, still no news, still no indication that anybody in the West is prepared to take the step of starting negotiations with the Russians. Now, coming back to my point right at the start of this program about what George Beebe and Anatole Levin, who advocate negotiations and who think the Russians might be respective, re responsive, say, and what um, um, is being said by Mr. Grenier and E. Smith on the other side, which is that the Russians are most unlikely <laughs> to agree to negotiate with the West and by the way, with the West, and by the way, they've had massive reinforcement of that from the latest comments by Dmitry Medvedev. He is now quite, again, openly coming out and saying that there really isn't any point in even thinking about negotiations. And he's dropping very heavy hints that at the end of this conflict, all that's likely to be left of Ukraine is a small rump, <laughs> uh, basically around Lviv. Vov. <laughs> anyway, um, well, all that may be true. The Russians may indeed be fundamentally uninterested in negotiations. If they receive an offer for negotiations, quite possibly they will sit down and listen to what the Western powers and the Ukrainians have to say, but basically bat it away. Say that you know, nothing that the Western powers or the Ukrainians propose is remotely acceptable, especially given the disastrous history of bad faith. And in order to know how bad that faith has been, I would again strongly recommend um, two recent books, one by Glenn Deason, about the Eurasian New uh, uh, World Order and the war in Ukraine, and by Richard Sakwa about the lost peace. Anyway, it's likely, very likely, that the Russians will take that position. But, and this is my point, we will never know in the West until we try As thinking the saying that the Russians are unlikely to want to sit down and talk is not a reason for not seeking them out and trying to talk with them. It could be that the price that the Russians will exact will be unacceptably high for the West. I accept that. Or it could be that the Russians will stonewall during negotiations. But who knows? Just possibly, be believe it or right, maybe the Russians will decide that it might make some kind of sense for them to agree to something. We can't be sure unless and until we try. 
This is all I am saying. And obviously, it would have been far better if this had been done. Well, it was done in Istanbul in uh, March 2022. It would have been half, far better if that the West, instead of sabotaging that agreement, had got behind and supported it. It would have been far better again if this had been done, say, in the autumn of 2022, um, after Ukraine's um, counteroffensives in Kharkiv and Kherson region, which did gain, regain some ground. It would have been better still if it had been done in the winter of last year. Um, but of course, instead, the West went down this disastrous blind, blind alley of egging Ukraine forward into launching its utterly reckless and ultimately cataclysm, cataclysmically disastrous summer offensive. Well, it would have been better to have done all of that then, and it'll be far more difficult now, and the terms will be much harsher. But given the trend of events, which is irreversible. German generals talking about sending Taurus missiles, which they accept, will make not change anything about the ultimate direction of the war. Um, um, obvious problems with shells, which look like they're um, unsolvable. Um, problems of Ukraine running out of money. It's got a huge hole in its budget, which has to be filled. You fill it, and you it's like blowing wind into a ruptured balloon. You can inflate it for a while, but then the air will go out. And you'll have to go on inflating it. Um, problems like that. Ukraine running out of men. Washington Post admitting that there is no coherent mobilization plan. And how can there be? And... Well, given all of this, surely the better thing to try to do is at least try. Try and speak to the Russians and see what they have to say. To me, it is obvious. It is completely straightforward. It gets more difficult, more problematic with every day that passes. But, and it might not be possible anymore. Maybe that the, the moment for that has gone and gone forever. But surely trying to do this makes more sense than having Admiral Radikin play his games in the Black Sea, wasting more missiles, losing Ukraine more aircraft, managing to hit the odd Russian warship, which the Russians can then replace, achieving nothing of significance, prolonging the war in that way, even as thousands of men on the battle lines die and Ukraine, step by step, is brought closer to its ultimate destruction. Well, that's me for today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that um, you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can support our work via Patreon and Subscribe Star. Links under this video. Don't forget to check out our shop where you can buy the amazing things we have there. Our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, Please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel.